Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Directions Mag Geospatial webinar today, sponsored by our friends at NearMap. I'm Barbara Duke, editor in chief here at Directions Mag, with our webinar producer, Lynette Qualia. Thank you to the geospatial community for being our loyal friends uh, for 25 years now. We uh, hope that you'll continue to read future articles, daily news, listen to podcasts, and of course, catch up on all those webinars. We are excited to have George and Misty with us today. They have a wonderful collection of information and demos to look at how you can improve your workflow specifically with your imagery. So welcome, George and Misty. We are glad to have you with us today. So George, over to you first. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is George, and I'm one of the um, public sector um, solutions engineers for um, NearMap. And I'm going to walk you through a little bit of an introduction with um, NearMap. And then Misty, one of our power users here in Texas, will be giving a presentation on how she's um, using NearMap. And then I will give a uh, brief demo of um, Map Browser where you can access our imagery and how that can also be used a bit inside of. Um, Esri's um, ArcGIS Pro environment. So a couple things um, that people say about uh, NearMap. Um, some quotes here from some of our customers is, as long as NearMap planes are flying and product is being developed to help us through these uncertain times, we can make sure we keep our customers happy and our projects moving. Another quote from this gentleman with Elite Grounds says that Near, NearMap saves our staff between six and 12 hours minimum per job, eliminating time on site and preventing change orders has reduced job estimate time by 75%. So we are NearMap. Um, we were established in Australia back in 2007 and our shop here in the U.S. was set up in 2014. Um, our, we are based out of um, south of Jordan, Utah, which is just um, south of the uh, Salt Lake area. So we are a cloud-based subscription model. So we do software as a service. We work with uh, many, many customers and um, many, many partners across um, the country and including Canada and we cover a vast area of the U.S. Um, and definitely mostly in um, the most populated um, areas. Here you can see um, an oblique capture of San Francisco, um, just one of our, one of our many um, captures in our stack. A bit of overview of NearMap. Um, we are one of the um, leaders in location intelligence. Like I said, established in 2007, came to the US back in 2014. We've been kind of changing our model and our business model and um, our camera systems each year. They have been um, enhanced um, starting from Hyper Camera 1. Now we're at um, Hyper Camera um, 3. Um, we've gone into the artificial intelligence space um, a few years ago. Um, that's one of our um, leading products, um, giving customers a lot of different insights that um, may not be um, so accessible at certain times. So our content stack um, consists of vertical imagery, panorama imagery, obliques, Near Map 3D, Near Map Artificial Intelligence, and Near Map Impact Response. Vertical, of course, is um, high resolution top down imagery. Um, it integrates real well in a GIS environment and a CAD environment. Um, Panorama obviously gives a multi perspective aerial views. And it's a mosaic continuous view without having to do geofencing. 
Obliques also offer multi-perspective aerial views. With our obliques, you're able to do accurate height measurement and take measurements of roof slope and area of whatever you may be um, looking at. Our near map 3D, going to the next slide here, consists of textured mesh, mesh point cloud, the digital surface model, our digital elevation model, and our true ortho. Textured mesh is a 3D triangulated wireframe, and that's available in multiple data formats to use in different environments. Our point cloud is a vector file made up of points containing X, Y, and Z and color values in an LAS format. Our digital surface model is based on a raster file, and that could be delivered for use via GeoTIFF. I mean, it includes um, heights of both natural and built object environments. Our digital elevation model, or our DEM, is based on raster file as well, made up of pixels containing bare earth elevation and those values come in in a GeoTIFF format. Mature Ortho is based on a raster as well, um, containing RGB color values in a GeoTIFF um, format. NearMap AI consists of a lot of different um, layers that are available through our um, lightweight um, map browser. Um, this list continues um, to grow. Basically, you can turn these layers on and off um, to be able to look with um, our imagery to give you a little bit more of insight on an area of interest or a particular project area. Just a few facts about um, our coverage. Here in the US, we're about covering about 80% of the US, over 1,700 urban areas with our first capture coming in 2014. Um, that's 2014 number comes into play because you're able to scroll back through um, some of our different historical captures. Um, if we had captured it two, three years later, you can scroll back through um, the different imagery and begin to form some kind of a story on wherever site you may be looking at um, could be significant in um, storytelling or losing some of that legacy um, knowledge in certain um, cities or companies, those historical captures um, always are very, very insightful for newcomers and um, existing personnel. Some of the um, industries we're involved in pretty heavily are in government, utilities, um, but all sorts of organization and businesses use our aerial imagery and services. Um, I'm sure we haven't even discovered half of um, the use cases, but currently um, these are some of our, our customers were, or some of the industries we're involved in. Some of our um, users, range from large to small organizations, from local government to federal government. As you can see here, we're all over the country, different sectors, um, different responsibility um, that companies have using um, aerial imagery from the private to the public sector. Some of our partners, we are an Esri Gold partner. Um, we easily um, integrate with Esri. You're able to use us in um, ArcGIS Online. We have a marketplace item, various uses where, where imagery can be used. Um, anything having to do with Esri from desktop um, to mobile. Um, some of our other um, partners obviously are in the AutoCAD space, asset management, and various other GIS services um, partners. 
Um, so our access primarily comes through Map Browser, which is a um, lightweight, um, basically web page um, where you're able to um, switch between near maps, vertical um, imagery, or 3D imagery. You're able to make exports, um, various data, depending on um, what you need to use. Probably our most popular um, 3D um, mesh SLPK can be used inside of a Esri environment. Um, the Esri marketplace can be streamed vertical content into ArcGIS products as well. And those built on top of ArcGIS, like I said, could be used in a custom um, web out builder, um, as well as various other um, marketplace or marketplace item integration with, um, with our tools. Let's see here. And just to give you guys a quick peek, this is one of our tools of um, another, another tool that um, NearMap has is our bleak viewer. You're able to go in and make certain measurements, um, do certain annotations, search for an area um, where you're not able to possibly get on site, go in, have a little bit more intimate view of what you may be looking at. Um, and again, going through that um, historical imagery can be a pretty powerful feature depending on what you have going on. This is just um, a view of our Hyper Camera 3. Um, this is outstanding 2D quality and 3D reconstruction. Um, this current capture that you see here is at a 62% zoom. So very, very powerful, very, very detailed um, capture of a given area. This particular screenshot is at a 90% zoom. So as you can see, offers a lot of clarity and, um, you know, real world kind of um, idea of uh, your AOI or whatever construction site you may be looking at. So that's just a brief rundown of NearMap. I'm gonna hand it over to Misty, who's with the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority. You guys can see a little bit detailed of how she's using our aerial imagery. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Misty Downing. I work at the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority in Central Texas. I'm gonna quickly kind of go over how we've set up our GIS and then talk about several use cases of how we're making use of the near map imagery. So a little bit about me. I've been working in GIS and water resources actually for about 17 years. Uh, I came to GBRA, the Guadalupe Blanco River Authority about four years ago. Um, before that, I was actually at another river authority here in Texas, the San Antonio River Authority, for five years. So it was an easy transition. Um, the river authorities are unique, but they have a lot of similarities as well. And then uh, previous to that, I worked mostly in conservation and environmental science. Um, I do have two degrees in geography, um, got my master's in GIS at Texas State, um, and I am a GISP and a certified floodplain manager here in Texas. So a little bit about GBRA. Um, as I mentioned, the river authorities in Texas are all a little unique. They have their own enabling legislation. <clears throat> so GBRA's focus is water resources and water and wastewater utility services, among other things. Um, so I mostly want to mention what we do to indicate all the different ways that we are and could use GIS here at the River Authority. 
So we do water supply and distribution, wastewater collection services. That's our utility side of the business. Um, and a lot of what I talk about will focus on that because it's one of our core uh, lines of business. But we also uh, have a series of small hydroelectric dams along the river. We operate a larger reservoir down closer to the coast of Texas. <clears throat> um, and we have a river diversion and surface canal system down along the coast in Calvin County. Um, as a river authority, it's not unusual to also operate parks and recreation. We have a few parks and we do have an environmental sciences and water quality department. Um, while we do provide utility services, water resource management and sustainability of water resources in the basin is also a concern. So we have environmental education programs and we do community outreach. Um, the map sort of on the left of the screen shows our 10 county jurisdiction. So we do cover a large chunk of central Texas and then the actual river basin boundary, watershed boundary um, of the Guadalupe River. So even though it doesn't, our jurisdiction doesn't fully cover the basin, we have a lot of activities, responsibilities and influence even in those other parts of the watershed. This is just um, a screenshot of a dashboard that exists in one of our internal story maps called the Guad Squad Report. Uh, it's sort of an overview of our facilities uh, within uh, our district. So we have five water treatment plants, 13 wastewater plants, um, parks, and the dams. This is sort of a brief timeline of using near map at GBRA. It corresponds as well with the history of GIS at GBRA. So I started uh, in January of 2019. I was hired as the GIS administrator. Previous to that, GBRA did not have a GIS program. So it was very exciting for me. I got to come and do a needs assessment and talk to all of the divisions and departments and decide how we were going to set up GIS um, and implement the program. Uh, simultaneously with that, and the impetus for creating a GIS position was that GBRA was also starting a formalized asset management program. And so my very first day was a day long workshop kicking off asset management. Uh, and I mentioned that because it's a very key part, not only of how we use GIS, but why NearMap has been so useful for me. So that was in January. Um, we spent a few months evaluating what was needed to be and then really launched the GIS program that summer. This was outside of a budget cycle um, within our fiscal year. So I was lucky that I, I was able to purchase Enterprise GIS from Esri and get that set up. Moving into that first budget, I did um, immediately ask for near map services. Uh, I had come from San Antonio River Authority where we had been using near map for several years and I had been spoiled by it and you'll see why later. Um, I was asked to hold off on, on that purchase at first. Texas actually has a centralized uh, sort of GIS resource called the uh, TINRIS, the Te Texas Natural Resources Information System. They actually might have recently rebranded, so I apologize if, I, if I'm quoting them wrong. Um, they provide a Google imagery statewide service um, that I was asked to evaluate, and it is a great program and it is a great imagery service, uh, but it also uh, depends on your needs. And so we spent some time evaluating other options but moving into the next fiscal year, I did ask for NearMap and I worked with NearMap um, to sort of make a budget friendly request because um, I knew that if I could get my users um, to see NearMap and what it could do, that it would be justified. At that time, um, the GIS budget was very small. And so it did get approved, but the near map services alone were about a third of 
my entire budget for the year, uh, but it was worth it. Uh, I mentioned a few things here later in the timeline. Uh, NearMap was so popular that um, we realized we didn't have coverage in some of our key areas. And so NearMap worked with me and coordinated with some other entities to expand coverage for all of Comal County. And I'll talk about that in more detail later. Um, and then just this past fall, uh, we were able to finally get an enterprise agreement with Esri, and that has really taken GIS to the next level. So you'll hear me referencing that enterprise agreement a lot because it changed um, the resources we have and a lot of what we are doing and plan to do. And so a lot of where I'm at now is a redesign. We're four years in and I'm ready to kind of uh, take it to GIS 2.0. Um, and this past year in our budget, engineering approved adding to our actual um, budget to fly the rest of Caldwell County, where we have a key uh, water pipeline project going on. So to me, that's a huge testament to the usefulness um, and the value of NearMap that my users were able to see um, that value and put money in the budget to expand what we had available. So I'm not gonna go in great detail about these um, or read them or anything. My point with the, this slide and the next slide is, I did immediately set up a strategic plan for our GIS program uh, with a vision and a mission um, and key goals. And each year I do a work plan that sort of gives a quarterly overview of what we're trying to accomplish. I think that this is very important when setting up a new GIS program, but particularly when you're trying to justify a budget. Um, this is what speaks to that executive management level. And I think targeting some of those users, obviously targeting whoever approves your budget and making sure they see the value of GIS is important. So I usually do always encourage people to actually write up a plan, expl explain what GIS is doing for the agency, what is your return on investment, and keep this updated and keep it meaningful. So this is just our current vision and mission, um, focusing a lot on our regional role as an entity, and then building out GIS as a tool for a central system of record and document access and various things that really help save everyone time and create efficiencies. <clears throat> so I'm going to go through these also kind of quickly. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm trying to rearrange my screen. I've got some things in the way. Um, these are the actual goals from that strategic plan. Uh, there's just a few I want to highlight. Like I mentioned, system of record, easy access from any device, anywhere. So those are crucial to GIS being truly useful, especially when you have a large operations team with a lot of field staff. NearMap is helpful in that because it's a service, right? So I can just drop it into our GIS portal, which I'm going to show you, and make it available for any of our field data collection apps which is a very big part of how we use GIS here at GBRA. Because of that, it improves business workflows and streams, streamlines operations. And I'm gonna show you specific examples of that. Um, so again, as I mentioned, that strategic plan um, really helps to sort of quantify and have something you can reference at budget time on why you're doing what you're doing and what you're asking for. So the system we have set up at GBRA is Enterprise GIS. So we have um, a GIS server, um, the Enterprise Portal, which is the primary way that users use GIS at GBRA. We are mostly web GIS. I have very few desktop users. And then um, a lot of apps and field data. So along with asset management, um, we realized we needed to do a lot of asset inventory. So we got all of the operators uh, iPads and each division now has their own aero GPS units. 
and they've been trained on using GIS to field collect data or even just to provide me feedback um, and edits on the existing data. Uh, I'm not a utility operator by trade, and so having communication and dialogue, even through technology, the dialogue through the technology is very helpful um, to have us working as a team and making sure the data is updated and reliable. We are an Esri shop, so I did want to mention people, I think, especially if you're another administrator, you're kind of curious on what people have set up. So we are upgraded to 1091. I'm holding off a little on moving to Enterprise 11. Um, I'll wait until 11.1 comes out. But we do make full use of server and portal and a lot of the different configurable apps uh, within Enterprise. And I'll show you examples of those. And then, as I said, we do a lot of field data collection. So we are in the process of migrating over fully to field maps. That's part of our work plan this year. But we do still use a lot of collector and survey one, two, three as legacy. We're in the process of training everyone on field maps and just getting them comfortable with using that. Um, it's also helped to have our enterprise agreement now that's really expanded our licensing. So a lot more people are able to interact and edit data than could before. Um, and we do use Quick Capture as well. Uh, anyone familiar with Esri products knows that each is unique for its own purpose. Uh, as I mentioned, we're mostly a web GIS shop. Um, I do have a few desktop users. When I started at GBRA, there was only three licenses for desktop and that was all they had for GIS period. Now almost everyone accesses GIS through portal or through a field app, but we do have some engineers that do water modeling and wastewater modeling, and they use desktop GIS and they use near map with their desktop GIS. So this is a sort of a compiled view of our portal, the way it's structured now, it's hard to get a good screenshot, but I put it in here because almost every one of these viewers has near map as a service and is it's very relied upon. Um, I pulled out just a few examples of our more popular apps. These are the ones that were at the top of the line. So this is the road services area. This is for engineering to monitor development in one of our very rapidly growing wastewater service areas. Um, and you can see here that near map imagery um, is down at the bottom of the layer list. Uh, I am a little sensitive because I'm in the process of redesigning our entire portal. So these viewers are kind of, they're kind of my old viewers. Um, they're still in use, but I'm making them using Experience Builder and really enhancing the tools and the look and the user interface for these. Um, so near map imagery here with roads on top. I will tell you if near map for whatever reason isn't working, which usually it's just something on my end that I need to correct. I hear about it immediately. It's one of the, the ways that I know that portal is getting used. Um, similarly, in one of our other operate more operational viewers, Hayes Caldwell, near map is there in the layer list. It's in all our maps. Um, near map is a common term at GBRA. Everyone knows what it means at this point. And again, different viewer, same thing. Um, and you can see I have near map turned on and so you can see the coverage, which I'll talk about in a little more detail in a minute. So I just, I didn't, uh, I wasn't going to do a live demo because I didn't want anything on my system to kind of <clears throat> cause problems, but these are what our viewers look like that we use every day. This is some of our uh, deputy division managers of operations and plant managers out in the field collecting data. Most of our um, field maps also use near map, which can be very helpful. We are in a very rapidly developing part of the country. Uh, and I'll show a little bit of that in near map imagery later. Um, but I included this to mention that this is my upper level management. So it's not just field staff that are out there um, in the field or interacting with near map. It's our general managers, our executive managers, our plant managers and division managers. So I've kind of 
mention this a little, but um, the actual users we have at GBRA, we have about 200 employees. Most of the GIS users are engineering and operations, but we do have users from all departments, including, you know, like I said, the management team, our environmental science, um, just a handful of desktop users. Uh, we just don't use a lot of desktop. I mean, myself and my GIS analysts do a lot, but uh, most of the rest of the agency uses Portal and Web GIS. Uh, looking at Portal, we have about 140 users, um, with 60 being very active or active. Those are my definitions, but that usually means if they either log in daily or weekly. So it is a become a standard tool for the workday for pretty much a, a large chunk of folks at GBRA. And then we have about 20 to 30 active mobile workers. It really depends on what's going on operationally, um, what they're needing to do, if we are needing to do a field data collection effort, that sort of thing. So this again is that same jurisdiction and um, watershed boundary from the earlier map. I wanted to show our near map coverage. Um, this is where it gets interesting. I mentioned that Google imagery service, which is statewide, that I was asked to evaluate. Um, but near map really, um, it's flown more often. So there's different flights depending on what where you are with the near map coverage. But along the corridor of 35, which is where a lot of our facilities are, uh, they fly three times a year. So that relevancy, that up-to-date imagery is really helpful. And then the resolution, the high resolution is incredibly helpful. And I'm gonna show some examples of that. So along 35, all the little stars are just different GBRA facilities. I mostly just wanted to show why we did choose NearMap. Um, even though it doesn't cover our whole jurisdiction, it absolutely covers uh, where we have most of our areas of work and concern. Um, these two counties here, Comal and Caldwell, are where I mentioned earlier that we uh, expanded the coverage of NearMap because we wanted to capture more of our facilities. Caldwell was just flown at the end of 2022 around Christmas, um, and we have these projects going on. And so that's been really great. It's been used a lot already in the past two or three months. <clears throat> so I'm going to go over some specific examples of using NearMap. Um, I tried to think of as many as I could, and I had engineering and operations chime in as well. One of my first tasks, there was not only not a GIS program, but there wasn't any GIS data really. So linear asset data development was one of my first tasks. When I started four years ago, it was just me. Um, I've had a GIS analyst now for uh, since last May, so almost a year, which has been amazing. But for a while, it was just me. So it was a lot of data development and georeferencing plans. You can see um, that this is a brand new sub subdivision under development. This can be really helpful that near map flies so often because it can make a huge difference for referencing and data um, development when you can see features on the aerial, obviously. Um, so having these buildouts captured has helped us a lot. And then for people who maybe haven't used near map, the resolution is so good, you can easily see manholes um, and many other obviously surface features. But when you spend a lot of time mapping out wastewater collection systems, the ability to see these features is amazing. Um, before I click to the next image, I did want to say I didn't actually spend any time picking out this example. I just went into one of our subdivisions and zoomed into a manhole and I was like, well, we'll take it with near map and then we'll turn on the Esri base map. <clears throat> and this is what the Esri base map would have looked like. So again, <laughs> incredibly helpful um, to have that high resolution up-to-date imagery. This is just another example, um, a different part of our basin out in uh, our well fields and water lines. Um, you can see the vault feature along the water line clearly. 
And if you were to look at it with an Esri based map, that feature kind of disappears. Um, I did, we do have folks out in the field collecting data, but as often as I can, if we can see things on the imagery and create the data ourselves, that's obviously what we're going to do. It saves a lot of time and resources to be able to do this stuff from a desktop. Some other examples, um, George mentioned the historical data, um, which has been really valuable for us too. Different questions will come up. Um, we had um, some gate failures in our hydro dams that really changed um, the situation of our lakes. And so that first image was a more recent image of the river, and this is how it was historically. Um, so looking at these images, sometimes even doing analysis on these images has been really helpful for us in some of these projects. Um, this is a similar situation on a different part of the river where we can see how things are now and then historically where the water was. Um, this has come up a lot and helped with environmental management, particularly um, as the lakes are drawn down. Also development. So this is, again, a different part of the basin where we have a, this entire subdivision here is our wastewater collection system. This is how it was probably back in like 2019. And this is where it is now and continuing to develop. So NearMap has been very valuable for us um, in all of our wastewater, but particularly in dealing with this subdivision in this area of the watershed. Um, this is the 35 corridor right here. So rapidly populating. Um, it's used a lot in line locates. So that saves our operators a lot of time. They will get an email coming in when you call Texas 811 about digging um, or any development. They can usually get into the GIS and look at the near map imagery and decide whether or not that line locate is going to be relevant to us versus having to um, drive out anywhere and do an on the ground evaluation. Um, our engineering team also uses it quite a bit to evaluate easement encroachment. We have several cross county pipelines um, that are in areas that are rapidly developing. Um, so we've mapped out easements and they will regularly sort of do a review to see if there's easement encroachment. Another example just came up last week where our engineering, one of our engineering managers asked me, can we put, uh, we have a line relocation happening. And he said, can we put the new right of way onto near map so the appraisers can take a look at the near map imagery because it was just flown, you know, late December, early January. And so we set up a web map for us to be able to do that. And again, that's actually saving the time and expense of sending out surveyors, which can be very significant. Right of way maintenance. This is another very recent example where our um, executive manager of operations called me and he said, you know, Misty, they wanted to, um, one of the divisions was asking for money for doing right of way maintenance. So I went in and looked at the near map and I evaluated which areas actually need maintenance and which don't. Um, and so he was on his own, he thought to go and use your map for this. And then he informed me too that I needed to do some spatial corrections of our data. So I just trained this team to go out and do some GPS data collections. Um, so just another way that uh, without really any advertising from me, I do um, go to department meetings and I will pull up our GIS portal and sort of continual training, not just training one time, but all the time, uh, reminding them of what's available to them. But NearMap in particular hasn't needed a lot of uh, reminding. They, they find it to be a very valuable tool. And we also do a lot of construction inspection. We have a team of maybe six, six guys who are out there on all these projects doing construction. They're using the quick capture to do a lot of their inspection photos and having the near map has been really helpful for them so they can see features updated on the ground. Sometimes they don't have to go out in the field, but when they're there, it can help orient them. Or we've also used it historically to 
um, verify some situations between us and contractors. Um, so this is some of that Caldwell imagery I mentioned that we just paid to have flown because we have brand new well fields and brand new project out in a really rural part of the, the, the county. Rural for now, at least. And similarly, we are re, um, we're doing an expansion of this wastewater plant. So the near map imagery has been very helpful. It's been in our board presentations because we can show the advancement of all of the different uh, expansion of the facilities there at this wastewater treatment plant. And then just a little more traditional use, we do make at times some nice maps. We have a park up by the lake and this is near map imagery. This is a huge poster that's printed out at the park um, showing the different features along the trail. And it's nice to have the near map imagery. Um, for this park as well, I had recently given a presentation and mentioned near map because when the staff here first started collecting all their features, because uh, we were making a native app for the park to, to use, for visitors to use, we didn't have near map at the time. It, it, it didn't cover this far out into the county. This is Como County. So uh, we actually flew a drone and used drone to map and created our own imagery, which took you know a couple days of my team manager's time and then my time. Well, later, you know, once we had the coverage of Como County, those again are tasks that don't need to happen, free time that gets and resources that get made available because we have the near map imagery. So it's been nice to have it expanded to this part of the county. Those are sort of my specific use cases. I'm happy to take questions um, at the end if um, I overlooked anything or you guys want to know about anything else. Thank you. Alrighty, thanks, Misty. It was a really good um, presentation and it's a heck of a difference between our imagery and stuff that you pull up from um, other base map, uh, you know, sources. I used to um, be on your side um, and working at various different cities. And yeah, when I got to use um, Near Map for the first time, it just completely enhanced um, my personal workflows as well. I'm gonna walk you guys briefly through um, a bit of a map browser when it comes to um, our lightweight uh, browser here on the internet. Um, so inside of Map Browser, typically you'll have um, a login and password and it'll come up typically um, with our landing page where you'll have um, various um, options where you can go into um, different um, projects or um, dashboards, whatever you may have. Um, our Knowledge Hub is right in here. This is very useful if you're trying to figure out how um, to do something. Um, our integrations page, if you wanted to um, geofence an area and um, set up a particular API key um, to, to look at that inside of an environment like um, Art Pro. So when you click here inside of Map Browser, it'll bring you to um, a particular area. I've been happy to be working in San Antonio recently. So here in San Antonio, you're looking at a, um, a residential area. But starting off here, um, you could search for a particular area. Um, anywhere in the world anywhere in the in the country um this just happens to be um an address that i know off the top of my head but you can um search um for an address or a, a university like in this example and navigate um to the area um we'll go back to this here you're looking at um, ut san antonio where you can start um, taking a look at um, our various captures. Um, the, our vertical capture 
is um, our default um, view um, or rectified um, aerial map. Next, we go into our panoramic view. And this offers a 45 degree angle view um, at different cardinal um, directions. Um, our next view um, is our terrain model. Um, let's you look at um, how that um, topography of that um, certain area um, may be. Could be used in some kind of a site analysis um, or some kind of, of model building for various purposes. Um, our next base layer is on oblique view. This um, provides individual photos of an area taken again at a 45 um, degree angle. We also have um, our road features where if you are in a certain AOI, you can see um, what the name of whatever road um, area that you may be. Our next layer here is our true ortho, and this is um, a continuous ortho mosaic. Um, it's an option that is also available um, through our um, 3D export. And finally, it's our 3D view here. It basically will stream um, near maps textured mesh um, inside of map browser. Here you can navigate having a little issues here with um, our internet connection, but you're able to get into these buildings in a three-dimensional um, view for any kind of purpose you may have in um, your AOI. Switching back to vertical here, as I pointed out earlier, is our historical content. As you can see, this capture was done in late 2022, but it goes far back um, to 2015. San Antonio looks like it's captured up to three times a year. Typically, it's done leave off, leaf on, leaf off, um, probably like in the spring, summer, and another capture um, in the fall. Um, inside of here, you can also do a split view where if you wanted to see um, some kind of change detection or what may have been added or whatnot um, can be done here um, with, with a split screen. Um, it allows you to compare imagery of location across two different surveys, basically. Couple other tools in here, we'll get out of this vertical area, is our line tool. Um, our line tool just basically um, allows you to get pretty realistic measurements, um, it, whether it's um, length of a feature on our um, vertical imagery, um, it can measure the length of a path composed of multiple lines as well. Um, if you wanted to measure a area of a certain um, AOI. These measurements also obviously come with um, different um, information to them with our um, feature here. Obviously you can see line, um, line length, um, I could add notes to this if I wanted to capture like some kind of snapshot and export it, put it in an email, whatever um, that may be. Our polygon tool here is perfect for getting approximate measurements of an area on vertical imagery. 
um, simply we could just again um, draw this, get its measurements, whatever um, it may be. Gives you area, perimeter, various um, stats about a given area. All right, going into our layers here, these can simply just be deleted. Let me go. There we go. Here are some of the various layers um, associated in um, side of Map Browser. Here in the left hand panel, um, you have given um, cadastral data um, with various features. Um, that could be used just for some insight um, locations. We also have uh, road overlays, which like I mentioned before, gives you an idea of a street name of um, where you may be at. Inside of our road overlays here, you're also able to jump into different views um, given whatever you may need to um, look at. See, inside of a map browser, you can go into different workspaces. Um, you can title them, have date, bring in new projects, whatever it, it may be, so you can separate different projects um, when logging in. And these are automatic, automatically created when you go into um, Map Browser. See this example here. This is a KML is able to be brought in to um, view a certain um, project area. This happens to be inside of rural San Antonio um, as well. And it allows you to import um, additional geospatial information into Map Browser to view as an overlay on our near map um, imagery. Getting a little short for time here. Diving into um, our oblique imagery here a little bit more in detail. Like I said, this provides a 45 degree angle view of a location. Um, it differs a little bit from panorama and that is, is an individual unaltered photo of an area taken from different cardinal directions. Um, to access the oblique, um, you just drop a location indicator of interest and click view oblique photos. Inside of obliques, you also have um, Google Street View um, where you're able to get inside a um, Google Street View, but currently it doesn't look like this um, certain area has uh, that capture. Alrighty. Moving along here in our export tool, um, like I said, you're able to um, do 3D exports, choose um, a capture, 
give it um, projection information if you were to bring it in to um, something like GIX um, to Arc Pro. This textured mesh here is exportable via SLPK along with Point Cloud, DSM, True Ortho, and DEM. Our most powerful, sorry, I've lost my place here inside of the map browser. Is our near map AI with near map AI? You're able to see all sorts of different layers. Um, to view our AI layers inside of Map Browser, um, you could just you can select the attributes you want to visualize um, from your workspace um, under the data layers. Some of the most popular ones being uh, building footprints. As you can see, there's various ones in here, um, roofing characteristics. If there's some kind of um, inspection um, that may have to take place, um, you can see various um, these various features through our AI data. Um, some of our other most popular AI there's are stuff like asphalt. If you're doing some kind of um, inventory, and do some heads up digitizing um, from here. And sorry for the sake of time here, just to give you guys a quick peek inside of um, Arc Pro, you can bring things in like um, a WMS. You can export it from Map Browser, bring it in um, through a connection. Um, and set it up, paste your URL, and go to work um, with our um, historical imagery. Um, as you can see, you can bring in um, various um, vintages of whatever um, given area you have. Um, here, which is, which is available through um, an offline export, is um, our solar panel data. If you were working on some kind of um, emergency services uh, map, you can easily identify which residential areas as a warning to firefighters, um, what houses or residents have um, actual um, solar panels. This is a view of our mesh that was exported from Map Browser. You can go into Arc Pro for more analysis um, or whatever your um, case may be. So I am out of time here and I will hand it over for Q&A. Thanks. Uh, thanks, George. Hey, Misty, we have got a great question for you. Uh, what were key notes to obtain budget uh, for obtaining budget of the product? As a GIS person, all that makes sense to me, but what were the key parts that moved your executive folks to support you? Thank you. That is a good question. Um, I actually have two answers because um, sometimes it's, it's hard to know the mysteries behind the thinking of executive management. One, though, is the obvious one. Um, I was able to show cost savings in other ways. So as I mentioned, when I started, it was just me. We're doing a lot of linear assets development. The first year I had to hire consultants to do that. And um, at, at an expense, it was a significant expense. Um, once I could show that NearMap would allow me to uh, maintain linear assets on my own, uh, that justified the cost easily right there. Um, the other big reason, the reason I think actually that's more significant is just getting people to use the product. 
So the first couple years, I think everyone's sort of familiar with the idea of hearing about Google Maps. You know, it's like I spend my day creating this GIS portal and then someone will be like, well, I looked in Google Maps. Um, well, these days, what I hear is, did you look at near map? Or have you looked at the near map imagery? Or Misty, can you build me a web map with near map in it? Um, and so to me, because that's coming from my staff, but it's also the executive management and general management saying, I looked at near map, or can you show me uh, the historical near map for this area? That is what I think really made the difference, is they know the product, they know that it's flown three times, sometimes four times a year, and that it's high resolution. And so it, it kind of sells itself. Oh, that's awesome. I, I know that that's a, sometimes a tough conversation for many folks. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, Jorge, okay. George, um, quick question for you uh, is how do they find out what area near map covers for folks? Um, I believe we do have a coverage map available on our website. Um, if you logged into um, newmap.com and did a um, search on coverage, um, you should be able to have a visual um, on if, if your area is covered or whatnot. Great presentation, Misty and George. We really appreciate you sharing your expertise. We hope that you'll join us for more geospatial webinars. Go make it a great day. Tell a friend about Nearmap and Directions Magazine.